You asked for it, you can't unask for it. Welcome back to Reactarian. Today, we're going to be looking at Night at the Creation Museum, a movie starring Eric Hoven as a security guard who takes the night shift at a creation museum, only to have a wild and magical experience as the museum comes to life around him and teaches him about the biblical creation story. It's an obvious ripoff of the Night at the Museum movie starring Ben Stiller. And you might think that I'm being a little bit harsh there. After all, they're obviously playing with the same themes, but is it really fair to call it a ripoff? And to answer that question, I would like to draw your attention to the poster for this movie, where we see Eric Hoven and his co-star Tim Chafee dressed as Ben Stiller and Robin Williams from the actual movie, despite the fact that they never dress anywhere close to this in this movie. In fact, it's not actually even fair to say that they're just dressed that way. If you look closely, they very clearly just poorly photoshop their heads onto those characters. Look at those lines, dude. So before we've even started this movie, we can see that it's a little bit more than just a creationist spin on a popular theme. This movie is a scam that's attempting to leech off of the creativity of the actual film in order to get this film in front of more audiences that wouldn't have watched it otherwise. It is the transmorphers of creationist movies. It's also worth noting right at the outset that this movie isn't about just any creation museum. It is about THE creation museum. The one run by the never-ending pseudoscience clickbait factory known as Answers in Genesis. A place where bad arguments are constantly multiplied, but ironically, never evolve. So moving forward, try to keep in mind that this movie is not just a fantasy for Eric Holman. The information, and I use that word loosely, that is in this movie is all provided by Answers in Genesis. We've talked about them a few times before on this channel, but they crank out so much dishonest and easily debunkable garbage and spend so much of their time just screaming at fossils until they turn into Bible verses that I, as a professional science communicator, will never be out of a job. But before we get started, I'd like to take a second to thank my patrons on Patreon, as well as my channel members here on YouTube. You guys are the reason why I'm able to afford living and being a YouTuber at the same time. Those are not always easy to juggle. And I'd also like to thank the sponsor of today's video, Brilliant. Brilliant is an amazing education app that allows you to learn real math and science through fun, interactive daily lessons right in the palm of your hand. Instead of just passively watching videos, you'll dive into engaging, hands-on lessons that challenge you to solve problems as you go, making Brilliant much more effective than just watching boring lectures. And the best part is, they're offering my subscribers a chance to try everything they have to offer absolutely free for a full 30 days, plus get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium, and all you gotta do to get it is go to the link in the description below, or just go to brilliant.org slash forestfalcon. Brilliant's lessons are designed by an award-winning team of educators from places like MIT, Caltech, and Microsoft so you know you're learning from the pros. Plus, you're not just memorizing random facts. You're building real critical thinking skills, which are useful not just for understanding scientific topics, but for becoming a sharper thinker overall. Personally, I love their scientific thinking course, because whether you've got 30 minutes or just five, you can open the app, jump into a quick lesson, and have your mind blown by the physics underlying the world around you. And believe me, that feels way better than mindless scrolling. So get started today by heading over to brilliant.org slash forestfalci, or just use the link in the description below. Remember, you get to try everything that Brilliant has to offer for a full 30 days absolutely free, plus you get 20% off an annual subscription to Brilliant Premium when you use my link. Thanks so much to Brilliant for sponsoring this video, and now let's regret our way through an Eric Hoven movie. So the movie begins with a long credit sequence during which we see several displays around the museum. One of these displays appears to be meant to symbolize a castle built upon the solid foundation of the Bible, as opposed to the unstable foundation of science. And honestly, I really like this display because the science books are arranged so poorly. If you have a shaky and unreliable understanding of science, you're gonna end up like Eric Hovind with your whole worldview built upon magic. But if you take the time to just stack the books properly, that is to say, learn real science, then you would have a great, solid foundation, which, I should point out, would be taller than the biblical one. But anyway, that's just a metaphor about a metaphor and a museum full of bad metaphors, and we haven't actually really started the movie yet, so let's just move on. The movie really begins with Eric Hoven totally not flexing on us as he pulls up to the museum in a Camaro that he certainly did not just rent for this film. Then, having arrived at the museum, he informs us that he has no idea where he's working. Hey, Sarah. Did Ricky make it in okay? Oh, good. Yeah, I hate to run off like that, but I got a job at a new place. It's some kind of 
I don't know, museum or something. Also, the background music in this scene is Noel. Like the Christmas song, Noel. Yeah, I could do that. Okay. Oh, I gotta go. I'll see you at 7.30. All right, bye. Because why not, right? Eric, whose character's name is Derek, because he's incredibly imaginative, is then approached by Tim, whose character's name is Jim, because he is incredibly imaginative. Jim is revealed to be Eric's boss, and he immediately reminds us that this is a rip-off of a Ben Stiller movie by complimenting Eric in a super weird and unnecessary way. Did you bring your shield? I didn't know I needed one. The uh, museum come alive at night or something around here? You never know. No, actually, you, you remind me of Captain America, and I was expecting more Ben Stiller. Ben St oh! I got it. <laughs> oh, did I mention that Eric Hoven wrote this movie as well? Apparently, after graduating from the Kent Hoven School of Science, he moved on to the Donald James Parker School of Filmmaking, where everybody compliments the main character, and also the main character is you. I don't know why, but I just can't get over the fact that this dude actually wrote dialogue of someone telling him that he looks like Captain America. Honestly, I'm a little bit surprised that he cast this dude who's so much taller than him to say that. <laughs> We then walk over to the front desk as Derek explains to Jim that he's separated from his wife and moved here to care for his child. So you're new to the area? Oh uh, yeah, I uh, just had to move here to be close to my son, Ricky. Oh yeah, divorced? Well, separated. It's oh. kind of complicated. Okay. Sorry to hear that. How old is he? He's 10. Great. Yeah. They're fun age. Oh, they're a blast. This is meaningless information that will not affect the story in any significant way. At the end of the movie, he is going to go to the museum gift shop and get a dinosaur book for his kid and then call his estranged wife and say that he's bringing it to the child, he's going to spend some time with them. And it's meant to be heartfelt and emotional, but it all just comes across as dull emotion baiting that's kind of crammed in at the end. It's really boring. We then finally arrive at the front desk where Jim gives Derek a clear warning. Do everything on the list, in order. All right. And pay attention. Don't fall asleep. Oh, don't worry about that. I've done security for years. There's a reason it's both. Don't fall asleep. Yeah, man, I won't. I'm good. Okay. Well, you know, the last guy fell asleep, and he was never the same. What happened? Have you been to the museum? No. Well, here's your map. Okay. And here's your key. What is he going to do to him if he falls asleep? He said that the last guy who fell asleep was never the same, and then he dodged the question of, what happened? But even without that information, we can see that they need a new security guard, otherwise Derek wouldn't be here. This is a little bit more than just set up at this point. This feels like a threat. I'll see you at six in the morning with the morning crew. Do the lift. Just do the list. In order. In order. Don't fall through. Uh, have a good night. Don't step on any kids. <laughs> what did he just say? Don't step on any kids. <laughs> good advice. Say what you want, it's good advice. We then get this little sequence of Derek goofing around behind the desk rather than doing his job. I've always loved these things. Attention museum guests. <laughs> Did you guys meet Gigantor? Just introduced me to my new job. I knew he felt weird about that guy being taller than him. Between that and the don't step on any kids thing, he is coping really hard with his casting choices right now. Finally, at long last, security guard Derek, the security guard, decides to be a security guard and go check the building for the first, and spoilers, what will be the last time in this film. As he begins his tour, he walks by this wall where we see a plaque asking if human races are equal. Don't worry, we're gonna get back to that later, and it is just as awful as you think. From there, Derek walks up to this display on Lucy, which attempts to depict Australopithecus afarensis as a quadruped. Now, we've talked before in this series about this particular reconstruction and why it makes no sense, and we will return to it later on in this film. But in the meantime, we get this pointless scene of Derek trying to remember Lucy's name, flatly refusing to read the information in front of him and renaming Lucy to Dexter. The monkey! I remember you. What was your name? Dewey? Dewey? De 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 Deborah? Dex? Dexie? Dexter! 
This, directly after the silly little montage behind the desk, appears to be attempting to frame the character of Derek as this goofy, lovable guy to try to endear him to the audience somewhat, but in all actuality, refusing to read information that is right in front of you, coming up with your own random assertion, and then deciding that that assertion is true, is actually the exact kind of thing that Eric Hovind would do. Seriously, you should see his videos claiming that horseshoe crabs don't evolve. This is a surprisingly fitting moment for this movie. And especially when you remember that Eric wrote this character for himself, it just makes the whole vibe super awkward. Take a look at this 15 second sequence from when he comes up with the name Dexter to when he walks away. Dexter! <gasps> Dexter! I want you to know something, pal. You're not fooling anybody. They got you in your own little prison cell now, don't they? In all seriousness, what was that? We then see Derek walking through more of the museum, and he comes across a couple of displays of Adam and Eve which seem... intimate, to say the least. Two naked people. What kind of a museum is this, anyway? What's going on underneath those lilies, you know? And why was he leaning back that way? Like, I have a childish and dirty mind, but you don't need my mind to see that particular reclined posture, right? Like, there, there are very few circumstances in which that particular lean is warranted. We then see Derek checking doors around the museum, and one of the doors is next to this plaque which asks, Did plants die before Adam sinned? Which is a great question, because even if we don't know the answer, they certainly die now, and death is supposed to be the wages of sin, which makes you wonder what happened to make the god of the Bible decide that the pumpkins must be punished. Unfortunately, even zooming in, we can't actually see what's written on this sign, so we'll just never know what atrocities asparagus have committed, but we are provided with this helpful diagram, which explains that plants are not people. Thank goodness we've cleared that up. And it's around this point in the film that Derek finally realizes where he is working and that all of the images around him have to do with the Bible. Naturalistic evolution and biblical creation. Ha! Huh. Adam and Eve. I wonder if they think those Bible stories are true. And in this shot, we're back to the sign about human races. And if we zoom in a little bit, we can see what it actually says. On one side, it explains that the Bible teaches that we are all descended from Adam, therefore there is no racism in creationism. We'll get back to that in a little bit as well. But then the other side says that evolution is inherently racist, with a quote from famed biologist Stephen Jay Gould, which reads, Biological arguments for racism may have been common before 1859, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolutionary theory. The litany is familiar. Cold, dispassionate, objective, modern science shows us that races can be ranked on a scale of superiority. If this offends Christian morality or a sentimental belief in human unity, so be it. Science must be free to proclaim unpleasant truths. Now, if you ignore the fact that that quote is obviously just honestly stating the racist position and not in any way defending it, that sounds pretty damning. However, we have a technique on this channel that we like to employ anytime a creationist quotes a real scientist as saying something horrible. We find the original quote, and then we read the next sentence. In this case, the quote comes from Gould's 1977 book, Ontogeny and Phylogeny, where we find that he continues, If this offends Christian morality or a sentimental belief in human unity, so be it. Science must be free to proclaim unpleasant truths. But the data were worthless. We have never had, and still do not have, any unambiguous data on the innate mental capacities of different human groups. A meaningless notion anyway, since environments cannot be standardized. If the chorus of racist arguments did not follow a constraint of data, it must have reflected social prejudice pure and simple. Anything from an a priori belief in universal progress among apolitical but chauvinistic scientists to an explicit desire to construct a rationale for imperialism. 
He did not say evolution can be used to justify racism. He said some people seem to think that evolution can be used to justify racism, but it clearly cannot. And Answers in Genesis took that quote, chopped the end off, and put it on a plaque. And that is why they are among the most dishonest people on the planet. Now, Eric is not, to my knowledge, a representative of Answers in Genesis, so it's tough to criticize him personally for what's on that disgusting sign. But he is in their museum, promoting their terrible message, so while we're on the topic of racism, maybe we can talk about the time when Eric worked for a YouTube channel called The Truth Group, and they published a video called What is a Brontosaurus, which has since been taken down and I can't get on the Wayback Machine, but I do have some screenshots of, like this one, where his co-star was portraying Professor Shama Lama with orange painted skin and a fez cap and a reportedly grotesque Indian accent, and Eric himself played Dr. Ding Dong, complete with a conical hat, Coke bottle glasses, big old buck teeth, and you can guess how he's speaking there, right? Turns out the call about a shady racist past might just be coming from inside the house. We then get another way too long montage of Derek goofing around behind his desk. Roar. <laughs> I will get you. You killed my father. Prepare to die. <clears throat> I am your father. <laughs> Sir, you have a job. Derek then decides to take a little nap, because napping and sleeping are different things. And he's not allowed to sleep on the job, but he is allowed to nap on the job, because napping isn't sleeping. Because if napping was sleeping, they would just call it sleeping. But because it's called napping and not sleeping, that means he's allowed to nap. And I swear to Glob, I'm not making this up. That's actually what he says. A nap isn't sleeping. If a nap were sleeping, it'd be called sleeping. It's napping. Totally different. Just 10 minutes. Eventually, Derek is startled awake by a loud noise. What is that? That's the camera guy, Derek. We can see him right there in the door. Derek then begins running up to displays and screaming at them. It's supposed to look like he's clumsily falling into the display, being startled by it, and then clumsily falling into the next display. But it's very clearly just him running up to something, screaming at it, turning his body, and then running towards the next thing to scream at. It's so poorly done and painful to watch, but mercifully, he eventually frightens himself into a new part of the museum dedicated to addressing the problem of evil. The displays in this part of the museum show scenes of death and drug use and terrorism and wolves, I guess. Ostensibly to push the message that the pain of this world is not the original plan or that it's nothing compared to the beauty of the next world or something, I don't know. Then Jim appears like a ghost out of freaking nowhere. <gasps> Jim! And to his credit, Derek does actually present the problem of evil just a little bit. I still don't understand, man. I mean, if God really created the world, you gotta ask, why is there so much evil and so much suffering in the world? It hasn't always been like this. Sure it has, man. Animals have been killing each other and suffering for millions of years. Oh, you mean evolution. Yeah. But then they immediately just drop the ball on answering that question because animals eating other animals is evolution, I guess. And so rather than addressing the giant gaping moral hole in his worldview, Jim magically snaps Derek back to the display about Lucy. What happened? What'd you do? Oh, Dexy. No, not Dexy. Lucy. Lucy? Australopithecus. Afarensis. You know, missing link, one of our ancestors, right? Not a missing link. The concept of a missing link is a creationist straw man used to knock down the concept of evolution for anybody who doesn't know how the fossil record works. 
You see, what happens is we find this species here and this species here, and the creationists point out that there's a big gap between those species. So then we find this species that bridges that gap, and now they say that there are two gaps here. So we find this species, and then this species, and then they say, look at all the gaps in the fossil record. Where are all the missing links? Wow, this evolution stuff sure does take a lot of faith, right? And of course, none of this addresses the fact that the fossil record is neither the only nor the best line of evidence for evolution, or the fact that the fossil record is necessarily incomplete. Fossils are very difficult to form, very rare to find, and very expensive to preserve. So well-trained anatomists and paleontologists have to do the best with what they have, using limited pieces to put together a massive puzzle hundreds of millions of years in the making. And as someone who actually has some training in this area, I can tell you that it's not always easy. It's strenuous and tedious and technical and difficult. And it's certainly not something that you can just brush off by saying that Australopithecus literally means southern ape, therefore Lucy is just an ape. Anyway, let's now watch Eric and Tim brush all that off by saying that Australopithecus literally means southern ape, therefore Lucy's just an ape. I learned about her in school. Yeah, yeah. only problem is, not a missing link. No? And not one of our ancestors. Really? Australopithecus, southern ape. She's an ape. Yet, when they depict her in museums and zoos around the world, oftentimes they put human feet on Lucy. Take a look at the skeleton behind Lucy. How many foot bones do you see with her? She doesn't have any. That's right, none. And yet they put human feet. Why? Because that is their, that's their bias. It's always immensely frustrating when creationists talk about Lucy as if she is the only proposed link between anatomically modern humans and our most distant ape ancestors. Lucy was an Australopithecus afarensis. We have a dozen species before and after hers, which show a clear transition all the way up to our species, Homo sapiens. We also have plenty more specimens just of her species, some of which include partial feet, which are quite human-like. And even without the feet of her species specifically, all members of the Australopithecus genus have bowl-shaped pelvises for anchoring thigh and gluteal muscles, they have valgus knees turned inwards to keep the center of gravity directly below the hips, and they have an anterior foramen magnum for holding the head straight up and down. And even without any of those fossils, we have the Latoli footprints, which show in the mud that upright walking was occurring half a million years before Lucy even existed. It's really important to remember that obligate bipedalism, full-time upright walking, is not a characteristic with only one trait involved. There are so many different traits that all come together to produce this one combined effect, and those different traits evolved at different rates and in different ways. And yet people like Ansys and Genesis continue to try to convince you that us crazy evolutionists think that somewhere in the fossil record, there's a time when we were all walking on our knuckles, and then a chimpanzee stood up and lost all its hair and became a human, and that is simply not how anything works. Even if you throw out Lucy, even if you throw out her entire species, we still have more than enough evidence in the fossil record alone for a slow, gradual, naturalistic transition from quadrupeds to partial facilitated bipeds all the way up to full-time bipeds like Lucy. But it sounds like nobody told that to this guy. And since that time, we have found more specimens of Australopithecus and we found foot bones. And their feet are very ape-like, just like their skull. Do you notice how this guy keeps just saying Australopithecus? As if the word Australopithecus is synonymous with the transition from ape to man? In reality, there's lots of different species of Australopithecus. There's Australopithecus afarensis, which is Lucy's species, and then there's also Australopithecus africanus, and Australopithecus sediba, and Australopithecus gari, and Australopithecus anamensis, and several more, each with their own unique suite of characteristics, each with their own unique place on our phylogenetic tree, which bioanthropologists are studying and trying to figure out to this day. But, of course, Ansys and Genesis doesn't need you to know any of that, because disagreement and debate in science just proves that science is unreliable. You know, the same way that all the biblical scholars who disagree with their interpretation of the Bible proves that the Bible is unreliable, right? The large one there in the middle 
is Australopithecus. That's the same species as Lucy. Again, Australopithecus is not the same species as Lucy. Australopithecus is the same genus as Lucy. There are several other species among the genus Australopithecus. These people don't even know what they are trying to debunk. And you see the other ones around there, the gorilla, the orangutan, very much the same. Not very much the same at all. The Australopithecus skull in that case has significantly reduced maxillary prognathism, a reduced jaw, no canine diastema, and a larger brain case. These are all things that you could easily notice if you gave half a crap about what you were talking about. Lucy was an ape. We know Lucy was an ape. Humans are also apes. This whole thing has been apes for a real long time. Have a look at this. The top is a blank Lucy form. And you can do whatever you want with it. If you want it to look more like an orangutan, you put the orangish brown hair on it. If you want it to look like a gorilla, dark hair, dark eyes. And if you want it to show intelligence, almost like it's becoming human, you put white in the eyes there, which no ape has, only humans have that. I have heard so many creationists bringing up this exact contention, that only humans have a white part to our eye. The white part of your eye is called the sclera, and all apes have them. This is such an absurdly silly claim to make because you can very easily just Google image search apes looking off to the side and you'll be able to see the sclera that they all have. Just because humans have a more prominent sclera does not mean that we are in any way unique in having one. And yet people like Answers in Genesis keep saying this bizarrely stupid lie and hoping that you'll just never look at a chimpanzee sideways. It's just, it's the dumbest hill to die on, next to the rest of creationism, I guess. How much of those things are preserved, the hair and the eyes, how much of that is in the fossils? Well, none of it. None of it. So it's showing the artwork, it's showing their worldview. So a trained paleo artist superficially making an australopithecine look slightly more like an extant species of great ape is just them showing their worldview. But you guys putting an australopithecine on all fours and covering them in black gorilla-like fur, which you have no evidence for and strong evidence against, isn't. Got it. For the record, this is a picture that I used in grad school to illustrate some of the hominin-specific adaptations that I was studying at the time. This picture represents Australopithecus africanus, so not the same species as Lucy, but still an Australopithecine. And you'll notice that they're not super human looking in this. They're pretty chimp-like and they're covered in a lot of fur. And that's because the size of their sclera and how much fur they have on their bodies isn't the point of those pictures. The point of those pictures is to show their behaviors, how they're utilizing their environments, what the environment they were living in looks like in the first place. You know, the things we have evidence for. But I don't know, man. Why would so many scientists believe in evolution? It's, it's probably gotta be true. You know what, let's go see what evolution leads to. A, a human? Caged as a zoo primate? They put him in a cage in a zoo just because they thought he was part monkey? They did. I know that the movie reviews on this channel are some of my most popular videos because they're generally pretty silly and I get to make a lot of jokes, but there is no joke that I can make here. This is genuinely repugnant and I hate that I have to dignify it with a response. Otabenga was part of a human zoo in the early 1900s. He was purchased from a slave trader and kept in a cage with an orangutan in the Bronx Zoo. These human zoos were relatively common at the time because the common racist beliefs of the time allowed people to believe that different cultures and different peoples were inferior to their own. And so putting them on display in this way was no different than putting any non-human animal on display. While the thoroughly debunked pseudoscience of what is known as social Darwinism does play a role in that story, a misunderstanding of evolution is far from the only factor. And it is absolutely abhorrent to me that anybody with half a conscience could try to co-opt that story into a cautionary tale about where the belief in science leads. But since Eric Hovind and Answers in Genesis want to talk about the adverse consequences of a belief, why stop at evolution? Let's talk about the Christian slave owners right here in America 
who use the Bible to justify their practices, like the many, many passages which condone slavery, which talk about where to get slaves, which talk about how to beat slaves, which talk about how to treat Hebrew and non-Hebrew slaves differently, which talk about how slaves should obey their masters, especially their Christian masters, or which talk about the curse of Ham, which was commonly used to condemn black people specifically to a state of slavery. There's even the Slave's Bible, an edited version of the Bible used by British missionaries in the 1800s to convert slaves to Christianity by cutting out all the passages that talk about freedom or rebellion or liberation. And since Answers in Genesis doesn't mind taking quotes out of context to try to make someone look racist, you know, like they did with Stephen Jay Gould a minute ago, I'm sure they won't mind me opening up this page from their website where someone writes in to say that Christians used to use the Bible to justify slavery, and they respond with, You state that white Christians have often used the Bible to convince themselves that owning slaves is okay and that slaves should obey their earthly masters. You are correct. Now, of course, it doesn't matter that in the very next sentence on that page, they say that those Bible verses are taken out of context. And it doesn't matter that for the rest of that document, they try to draw a distinction between biblical slavery and what they call harsh slavery. And it certainly doesn't matter that I think that both of those arguments are stupid and ridiculous because the Bible very clearly condoned slavery several times and in several forms. And also, I can't believe I have to say this, there is no such thing as acceptable slavery. All that matters is that I took one part of a short sentence out of a larger, more nuanced discussion and used it to make it look like Answers in Genesis holds a belief which is inherently racist. Exactly like they did to Stephen Jay Gould and put on a big plaque in the middle of their museum. What a totally cool, honest, and not at all despicable thing to do. From here, Derek brings up another issue about stars. But it doesn't change science. I mean... We know the Earth is billions of years old. I mean, how else would we see starlight that's billions of light years away? And is teleported to a planetarium to meet with Dr. Danny Faulkner, a PhD astronomer who works for Answers in Genesis. Young oh. man, come down from there. What's going on here? Yeah, you know, you're right. A lot of people have questions about distant starlight and time. Some people have suggested the speed of light has not always been what it is today. Some people suggested relativistic uh, sort of solutions dealing with general relativity. On the other hand, maybe God performed a miracle during the creation week to rapidly bring the light here. Now we're back to another miracle. Yeah, you know, the Big Bang model also has a miracle too. What? Yeah, there's a thing called the horizon problem. Early in the universe, getting light to travel across and bring the temperature of the universe to one single temperature. But they've tried to solve that with what we call cosmic inflation. Though there's no evidence for it and nobody knows how it works. The horizon problem is a weakness with the Big Bang model, and cosmic inflation theory, which proposes a brief period of rapid exponential expansion before the more gradual uniform expansion that we see with the rest of the Big Bang, is one solution to that problem. Now, I'm a biologist, not an astrophysicist, so I'm not prepared to dig too deeply into the details here. But I do know that cosmic inflation theory actually solves several problems with the Big Bang model, and it more closely matches the data that we have from things like cosmic microwave background radiation. So even if we don't know exactly how it works, it's pretty clear that something like that did happen. But of course, Answers in Genesis is constantly pushing the idea that if you don't have a detailed explanation of every single part of every single mechanism of every single event, then you don't have any evidence at all. Unless you are talking about creationism, that is, in which case it's okay to just say, I don't know, some guy did it. So you're telling me the Big Bang has a miracle, but it doesn't have a miracle maker. And creation has a miracle with a miracle maker. That's about it. Okay, some other guy did it. Do you believe it now? They have a miracle maker. It's some guy. Now the Big Bang is a miracle maker. It's some other guy. Also, the other guy says their guy doesn't exist. Is this a productive conversation? Is this how science works? Or is it acceptable to just say there are certain aspects about the early universe that we don't understand yet, but just because we don't understand them doesn't mean that they're miracles, it just means that we don't understand. It is so incredibly important for you to remember that as much as Answers in Genesis desperately wants to frame this as science and creationism, as two equally credible ideas on equal playing fields, 
What's actually happening is that you have physicists using the best mathematics that humankind has ever contrived to come up with massive explanatory and predictive models that tell us about the smallest and largest things in the entire universe. And then over here you got Answers in Genesis going, Nuh-uh. It was just some guy. There, there wasn't space yet. And then this guy just came along and he like made space happen because he's like a space wizard. And that's where space comes from. It was just, it was, it was the magic space guy. So for all their talk here about how scientists don't have adequate explanations for this and that and the other thing, let's not kid ourselves and pretend like those explanations would ever actually make them let go of their dogma. When we don't know something, that means some guy did it. And when we do know something, that's how the guy did it. Then we get a free shot of this dude's crusty grippers for absolutely no reason. You're not wearing any shoes. Nah, I don't like shoes. <sighs> and then he assaults Derek with a teddy bear. Meet Teddy. <gasps> teddy? Wake up, Derek. <sighs> Why are we slapping each other? Derek, wake up. Wake up, Derek! Ah! What is this movie, dude? So now Derek leaves the planetarium and begins walking through the museum when suddenly... This whole part is such a great sequence because it really shows where the budget for this movie went. And that is straight in Eric Hoven's pocket. This whole thing is filmed inside of a museum that was already built. All the lighting looks like it was done or was actually done with a flashlight. In the credits, it says that this whole movie was shot in 24 hours on a cell phone. The one special effect that they have is this terrible, floppy Spinosaurus suit, which has no serious effect on the plot whatsoever, by the way. It goes in a totally different direction than the rest of the film, which has been all about the ghosts of creationism past and present, guiding Eric around a wonderland of bad arguments and worse acting. But hey, if you're the type of person who thinks salt is spicy, you gotta find excitement somewhere. Fortunately, the Floppasaurus does jumpstart another sequence of Derek running up to things to be afraid of. You don't have to be afraid of these guys. They're all dead. Whoa! And that brings us to the next part of the film, which Derek very easily could have just walked to or gotten snapped to straight from the planetarium. After all, he got snapped there from where he was at in front of the other dinosaurs, so it's not like it would have made that much of a difference. We just had to take this little dino detour. And who can complain besides literally everybody watching this movie? You know, a lot of people have been taught the dinosaurs lived 65 million years ago. The truth is, they were created on day six, the same day that God made Adam and Eve. No way, man. You're telling me that this guy lived with people? He's a fossil. How do you think he became a fossil? Uh, well, he probably died. Uh, yeah. And then, um, well, you see what happens is uh, he lays there and it takes like millions of years, but uh, leaves and... Uh, sticks, rocks, it, it, it kind of get buried on top of them and uh, it gets super, super heavy. And then it, you're uh, squished into a fossil. I know that in this movie, Eric is supposed to be playing this goofy ditzy guy, but I can't help but think that that was Eric Hovind actually trying to answer that question. It doesn't take millions of years to form a fossil. No? It just takes the right conditions. They need to be buried rapidly in mud or other sediments 
You see, fossils are found all around the world right. in what we call sedimentary layers, which were laid right. down by water. Yeah. I'm going to go and brace you right now. What they're about to say is, in my opinion, the actual worst argument in the entire movie. They're going to say that fossils prove that the Bible is true. And it's how they get there that is astonishingly, breathtakingly brainless. Buckle up. Well, do you know what that means, right? Well, yeah, the, uh, that means the... Uh, uh, All around the world. Right, yeah. Uh, uh, they, they, rock layers laid down by water. Water, yep. So, yep, they... Uh, with lots of dead things. Of course, yep, so... All around the world. That means that there was a worldwide flood. Just like described in the book of Genesis, which is found in the Bible, the history book of the universe. The fact that fossils are often made in mud, and that we find fossils all around the world, means that there must have been a single global flood to make all that mud and create all those fossils. It's bad enough that Answers in Genesis does not know all the different ways to make a fossil or how to date them properly. They apparently also don't know that you can make mud without flooding the entire world. This is not the first time that we've heard a creationist claim that the fossil record is the result of a global flood. Feel free to check out this video if you want to hear a few dozen reasons why that makes no sense. But in the meantime, while we're here, can we just appreciate the fact that if there was one cataclysmic global flood that eliminated almost all life on Earth and buried everything in one thick layer of mud, which is uniformly good at creating fossils, it would be absolutely absurd how few fossils we have today. Think about it. If the entire world was suddenly and uniformly covered in the perfect conditions to create fossils, along with the carcasses of almost every single living thing, everybody except for one dude, his family, and a relatively very small sampling of life on Earth, everybody else instantly buried. That would be the thickest, richest, most amazing fossil layer you could possibly imagine. That would be several meters of just dense, tangled bone. And yet, more often than not, Fossils remain rare, are often fragmented, and we never find different organisms from different points in the evolutionary timeline smushed together in a tangled mess of prehistoric gore. It's almost as if a global flood never happened. And don't worry, the arguments only get worse and lazier from here. I don't know if they just ran out of mildly interesting stuff to say, or if they just figured you've watched it this long, which means you're already bought in so they can bring out the really dumb stuff. Either way, we now get a glimpse of their archaeology section. Welcome to Biblical Archaeology. Wow. Biblical Archaeology? Oh yeah, one of my favorites. <laughs> Take, a, for example, David and Goliath. Heard of them? <laughs> oh yeah, Gigantor. Actually, he was a lot bigger than me. Oh, but he was from the city of Gath, and archaeologists have been excavating Gath, and in 2005 they found this potsherd and it has two names on there that are nearly identical to the name Goliath. And guess what? It's from that exact time period that David and Goliath lived. They found a piece of broken pottery in the city where Goliath supposedly lived with two names which are similar to Goliath. Incidentally, that's how we also know that Spider-Man is real. Because we have found newspaper clippings from New York City with names like Patrick and Paul. And those are pretty similar to Peter. What it means is that name was in use in that city at that time. So this wasn't something written hundreds of years later. It was written by somebody who had intimate details of the event and of those people. Yes, because everybody knows that you can't have more than one person with a particular name living in the same city. It's been illegal forever. Also, urban legends and folk tales never get written down, and exaggerations never occur. So if you find a piece of broken pottery with a name that's sort of similar to Goliath on it, that means there was a guy whose name actually was Goliath who lived in that place at that time, and also he was nine feet tall, despite the fact that you have no independent evidence for any of those things. Guys, that is how science works. So all these stories are true? No! Of course they're true. 
you know what? This is just a few of the thousands of examples of biblical people, places, and events that have been corroborated by archaeologists. I genuinely don't know how I would get this concept across to the people at Answers in Genesis, and I genuinely don't think it would matter even if I did. But I need you, the viewer, to please understand that each individual claim needs its own evidence. Abraham Lincoln Vampire Hunter is a work of historical fiction about Abraham Lincoln hunting vampires. It is full of real people, real places, and real events. It is also full of vampires. If I can prove to you that Abraham Lincoln really existed, that the state of Illinois and Ford's Theater and the White House really exist, that he really was president, and that he really did issue the Emancipation Proclamation, not one bit of that is evidence for vampires. So if you find a piece of broken pottery with a name on it that's sort of similar to the name of some other guy from a book that you like, that isn't evidence for that guy existing, nor is it evidence for any other part of the book, especially not the parts of the book with angels, demons, talking animals, and zombies. And never forget that with Answers in Genesis, it's not just about evolution. Evolution and the age of the earth are how they get their foot in the door and try to convince you to buy into their whole worldview. That includes dragons, that includes unicorns, that includes women being quiet and submissive and never having authority over men, and so much more. If you don't want to believe me about science, that's fine. But don't let them trick you into putting yourself back in the Bronze Age. That's interesting. That's more than interesting. It's God's word. Wow. 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 Oh, man. I'm, uh, I'm napping again. Uh, that looks like more than a nap. I, I, I would say that qualified as sleeping. I'm sorry, man. Hey, Derek. Derek, wake up! You can't. Why not? Not until you decide. Decide what? That you're gonna take all of this seriously. Wait a minute, he can't wake up until he takes the Bible seriously? So it was a threat at the beginning. Doesn't Sarah want Ricky to know about this? Wouldn't it be great if you were the one who got to show him this? He's bringing up his wife and kid now. Wake up and get out of there, dude! Didn't your, didn't your mom believe all of this? She didn't want you to blame God for her death. She wanted you to know her creator. How did he know his mom was dead? Did he kill his mom? How long has this plot been building? Your creator. What are you gonna decide? What will it be? He said at the beginning that the last guard fell asleep and now they need a new guard. What happened to the old guard? Did he choose not to accept the Bible at the end of his astral projection journey and now he's trapped in alternative facts dreamland? Is he the man in the Spinosaurus costume? When did this become a horror movie? That is some really incredible information you got. It seems like the answers really are in Genesis. And we dropped the title of the organization, everybody. You know that was part of the contract. All right, I'll think about this. Oh, ow. Oh. Oh. What was that? Ooh. What? Way too small of a reaction there. For somebody who's been goofy and overdramatic for the entire movie, that was his moment to really ham it up. And instead, Derek is acting like he just saw an especially large moth. Found it! <laughs> Morning! Morning. How did everything go last night? Oh. A gang of street toughs broke in and repositioned all the Adam and Eve dummies to be even more uncomfortably sexual than they already were, but Derek doesn't know about it because he was sleeping on the job and dreaming of you. Great! I mean, you know, 
Nothing got in, nothing got out. Well, that's great. That's what we hope. Yeah. All right, well, hey, Derek, why don't you follow me to the bookstore? I got a couple things I want to share with you. Okay. Jim then takes Derek to the gift shop and gives him the gifts for himself and his son that I mentioned at the beginning. And of course, they make sure to get long, solid, close-up shots of all of these titles so you can easily purchase them for yourself. And then Jim tells Derek that he could really use his help at the Ark Encounter as well. Tonight, we could really use you down at the Ark Encounter. Okay, is it kind of like this place? Yeah, it's a lot like this. It's okay. it's really big. Do the exhibits uh, scare kids? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they s scare kids and sometimes our guards too. <laughs> <laughs> and that paves the way for the sequel, Night at the Ark Encounter. This is real. I didn't make this. They actually made a sequel about the Ark Encounter, and that really is the poster for it. They just took the rip-off poster that they used for this movie and they just tinted it blue. Same photoshopped head, same everything else. Because Eric Hovind and Answers in Genesis are not just liars, plagiarizers, and con artists. They are also incredibly lazy. <laughs> and finally, Derek walks back to his compensation wagon and drives off into the sunrise, which just so happens to be in the same direction that the sun was setting at the beginning of the movie. The end. Except it's not actually the end, because immediately after the credits, we get a three-minute sermon from Eric Hovind and a trailer for his next terrible movie. And I hate that I'm saying this, but let me know in the comments if you want to see me watch that one too. Overall, I give this movie a science teacher challenge level 1 out of 10. It's an awful movie, full of awful arguments. And you don't really even need to be that well versed in biological science to get through it if you know the very basics of biology and the very basics of critical thinking. You should have no real problem getting through this movie unscathed. The worst part is, after all this, I still genuinely can't tell if this movie is supposed to be for children or not. The main character is simultaneously so goofy and awkward that it makes it difficult to tell if Eric is trying to make a quirky character that appeals to kids, or if he's actually just that weird and disconnected from reality. I also still don't fully understand what genre they were going for. At first, I thought it was supposed to be a family-friendly comedy, but between the implications of the lying wizard, the floppy dinosaur, the jump-scare teddy bear, and that one dude's feet, there were definitely plenty of horror elements mixed in there. I don't know, dude. I'm not gonna be recommending this movie anytime soon, even just as something to watch for fun. It was not fun. And with that, I'm Forrest Valkai. Thank you so much for watching, liking, commenting, subscribing, and all the other stuff you do here on YouTube. Please exit through the gift shop, pick up one of these sweet t-shirts. If you buy one with this design, all proceeds go to Doctors Without Borders. We've raised over $28,000 so far. Have an awesome rest of your day, and never stop learning. Bye-bye! Is this allowed? Is that allowed? Stop.